about yourself and what you do? Sure, my name is Rosalie Wilson. I'm a member of the Okanagan and Sequamook Nations uh, from the interior of BC, and I am a practicing lawyer. How did you start off in your career in law? What made you decide that field? Uh, I initially actually um, set out to become a, a doctor. Oh. And so I was in my first year of undergraduate studies in the Okanagan, and I took a political science course. And so for my term paper, I had to write on the Constitution, so something, some aspect of the Constitution. So of course, I chose Section 35. And from there, that really uh, ignited my interest in, in protecting and advancing Indigenous issues particularly from a legal context, so that's how it all began, was one, one term paper when I was 18 years old. Um, and when did you meet, first meet Louise Mandel? I met Louise Mandel in July of 2000. It was, and the reason why I can remember this quite, quite clearly is because it was the summer before I entered law school. And so I was working at the Okanagan Nation Alliance at the time as a research assistant, as a summer student. And uh, it just come, it, she was coming up for the annual, annual General Assembly in, at the ONA. And it was taking place uh, at, at Spuckman, which is Lower Nicola Band. And it's about an hour and a half from Kamloops. And somebody had to go and pick up Louise Mandel. And of course, being the, the bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, you know, uh, uh, law school uh, first year that I was at the time. I jumped at the chance because I knew who Louise Mandel was. And, and so that's how I first met her. I picked her up from Kamloops and spent an hour and a half driving her to, uh, to the ONA Annual General Assembly. And I remember, you know, by the end of that, uh, by the end of that car trip, she had said, I want to see your application on my desk when you're ready to article. And from there, that was the one place that I had set my hopes on. There was no other firm that I had ever, you know, given any consideration other than Mandel Pinder because Louise was just, you know, such a fantastic uh, lawyer that I really wanted to learn from. So that's when I first met her. Um, what was your experience on being an articling student for her? My experience being an articling student was, uh, of course, a wonderful introduction to the legal profession, but I think in generally the legal profession it, it's it's a shock to the system because law school doesn't really prepare you for it. Articling is really the art of teaching the students how to be lawyers. And so from that regard, it was a wonderful opportunity to learn from Louise in such a, a unusual aspect. She was working on a, a, a file for my community. And so I had the ability to work, you know, uh, on a legal matter of, with Louise for my community. And, and that really was the, the reason why I chose to become a lawyer in the first place, was to go home and help my nation, help my community, you know, give back. And, and so I think it was just such a, a wonderful opportunity to uh, have, uh, you know, an unusual experience. I, I didn't have the typical articling student experience. Um, I, I recall one time being, you know, in, in, the, uh, in a back mountain area doing trail mapping with elders and uh, a legal team uh, Ardeth Wacom and Haley Bruce were part of that, and it was under the guidance of, of Mandel Pinder, uh, Louise's firm. And here I am, um, and it's kind of a funny story, but during that year, we, Ardeth and I actually were chased by a bear, or well, we had stumbled across a bear on the trail, and we were close enough to smell it and to hear it growl, and therefore we're running up, uh, up the hill. So when you say, you know, what was my article <laughs> experience like, very unconventional, very um, meaningful. And I, I, the way that I look back on it is that I had the opportunity to learn from the best. Um, one thing about my relationship with Louise, I think that makes it special, is I was the last article student to work with her. And so for me, I 
so thankful that I, I had the opportunity before she uh, she retired. Um, and to me, that that knowledge and that experience is all that more special because of that. Um, does it is there a different experience that you have working with like your own band, your own nation, versus working for other ones? Can you talk a little bit about? <sighs> I. I don't necessarily think that there's a, a huge distinction. I, I entered the profession of, of law because I wanted to advance Indigenous legal issues. And wherever I have the opportunity to help a nation or a community, uh, it's very fulfilling. But for me, it, there is a, a personal, um, a very personal moment when I have the ability to work for my community and my nation because as I grew up I you know I I come from a very political family um, <laughs> very opinionated family at that too where I was always taught to you know um, not only defend our our title and rights but also to be mindful of those generations to come and that's my responsibility is as a, a Celix woman today is, you know, caretaking, you know, our land and our, our rights and, and the resources attached to that, that stewardship responsibility for those generations. So for when I have the ability to work on a, a case or a file that includes my community, I feel like I'm fulfilling that larger responsibility, not me as a lawyer, but me as an Indigenous person. And I think that's the difference when, you know, you do work for your own community. Um, during your time as an art student for Louise, what cases did you work on? Uh, like I said, I, I did work on, uh, the, the one that sticks out in particular is, is the Browns Creek litigation where um, my, this is the one I was referring to with my community, that uh, we were trying to seek an injunction to, to stop logging in the watershed right behind my community. It provides the, the clean drinking water for my reserve. And so at that time, that is, you know, that, that is always the, 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 the file that stands out the most. Uh, but as I was articling, I did a, a variety of issues, anywhere from taxation to, uh, oh goodness, economic development, uh, environmental law, uh, and of course, you know, always with the focus on uh, the underlying issues of Indigenous title and rights. Is Aboriginal law unique in the sense that it covers so many different aspects of like economy, taxation, versus other types of law? Or well, I, I think the, the difference between Aboriginal law and other areas of law is that it's highly specialized and it's ever evolving. Mm -hmm. So 30, 30 to 40 years ago, if a lawyer said, I practice in the area of Aboriginal law, I don't think a lot of people would necessarily understand what that meant. And Aboriginal law, um, it's it's growing. You know, when <clears throat> there there's so many, I guess um, it's almost a misnomer or it's it's too broad. When you say you practice Aboriginal law, there, you know, average or people who practice in Aboriginal law can do environmental law. They can do economic development, which includes like corporate governance. So there really are, you know, very distinct um, uh, sub areas of Aboriginal law, and so um, yeah, it, it's it, it's hard to just characterize it as a, a broad general statement or a broad area of law. Can you talk a little bit more about how maybe you've noticed Aboriginal law change over the years in terms of maybe rights of title or? <clears throat> the way that I, I, I gave some thought to this, um, and this is where I had to dig deep back into the recesses of how has it changed since I first 
um, started studying law, which was more years than I care to admit now. <laughs> um, but for about the last 14, 15 years, um, when I first entered law school in 2000, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People was a work in progress. And I think it had been a work in progress for upwards of 22 years. And so I, I entered at a time where, you know, Delgamuk was still fairly new. It had about three to four years uh, of being released, and people were still trying to figure out what it meant or how to satisfy that legal test. So since then, I've seen the UN Declaration or the UNDRIP, uh, you know, become ratified, and that has set uh, an international standard you know, to, to hold governments accountable for decisions that they make that impact Indigenous rights. And I've seen the law of consultation and accommodation come down decisions from the Supreme Court of Canada, you know, uh, creating obligations on, federal, on the federal government to, you know, meaningfully consult with First Nations on decisions that that impact their, their title and rights interests. And so I, I've actually seen it change. You know, when I first came in, I was, um, we didn't have as many uh, tools like through, you know, legislative tools or, or case law tools even to, to, uh, to work with. So as we go forward, you know, and there has been some changes, but probably not enough. <laughs> what are some changes that in your opinion, you'd like to see in the next couple of years, or even uh, the just reconciliation of Indigenous <laughs> title and rights issues in BC. But um, <laughs> I, I think that that's one that has been there for for more than a generation or two. And I think at the end of the day, I think that's probably the motivating factor for for most people who go into practicing Aboriginal law is that these issues still exist and, and how do we reconcile, you know, indigenous legal systems with a, 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 the, the common law, you know, so yeah, that's what I would ultimately like to see or I guess that's what motivates me, you know, to get up every day and, and do what I do. Have you seen some improvements in terms of the Canadian government acknowledging um, different Indigenous practices in terms of law and the legal system? Um, not, not as much as, as I, I think would be appropriate, but I don't think that is, you know, um, I don't think that's all that surprising. Mm -hmm. That, you know, the, the federal, especially a conservative government, you know, uh, is is not going to to welcome you know in indigenous legal traditions with open arms because it undermines their you know their Eurocentric approaches and especially in in BC where we have uh, you know very limited treaties, it becomes a real issue. You know, I, I think at the end of the day, it, it would. Um, <laughs> Reconciliation as a process is is a lot more complicated than just from a legal lens. Um, it, it it seems on you know on the surface that perhaps it is achievable, but it starts to displace you know systems that have been built to undermine indeed indigenous title and rights interests, our legal traditions, our knowledge, you know, all of that stuff. So it's um, yeah. Not a necessarily easy answer, but that's the answer from my perspective. Yeah. And then to go back to talking a little bit more about Louise, mm -hmm. um, from your point of view, how has her career kind of helped in that process of reconciliation? Louise and her like contributions. You know, I was again having a hard time trying to summarize that. How do you summarize, you know, the, the impact the Beatles have on rock and roll? <laughs> you know, or th this is kind of from a legal perspective, this is challenging, you know, and, and it all, from my understanding, is that it all happened, you know, very circumstantial how Louise entered Aboriginal law. Um, but I think Louise's greatest contribution is the, the creativity that she brings, you know, um, a thinking outside of the box, 
she she weaves in you know um, an understanding of our legal traditions and she's able to transform that into an argument that is persuasive to the courts that the courts can understand and can appreciate and I think that is um, it's a gift uh, it's like storytelling not everybody is a good storyteller and not everybody can be you know a, a, a litigator you know there's lots of lawyers out there but very few um, actual, you know, litigators, barristers, the ones that are in the Supreme Court of Canada arguing passionately, you know, and that's what she is. Um, she has that gift, and I think that's been her greatest contribution, you know, especially in a time where there were so few lawyers willing to stand up and talk about Indigenous legal issues, you know, in the Canadian uh, justice system. It was a very unpopular, you know, um, unpopular topic I think you know given the racism at the time and and whatnot that that made it all the more special she you know she brought those gifts and and through uh, through those her passion for the law and these issues I think that has been her her greatest you know um, uh, contribution to the legal profession and, and to our causes is there a particular story or case that comes to mind when you think of the passion that Louise has? Well, you know, I, I wish I had been a, a fly on the wall, you know, during the hearings of, uh, of Haida and Taku, you know, uh, but I wasn't with uh, Louise at the time. And, and so my experience always will be watching Louise Mandel argue, you know, um, at the courthouse downtown um, with on behalf of my community and for me just to sit next to her you know and and earning the right really to sit at the table next to her uh, when you enter in a courtroom there is a seating gallery and then there's a, a line with gates you know and these gates are are what is called the bar you know that's where uh, well the bar is really where where the the lawyers have the right to be and the public normally sits behind. And for me, it was a, a, very, a, a very long road to get there. And so for me, in that one moment where I got to cross the threshold from just being you know, an everyday citizen to having the right to sit next to Louise Mandela, she argued you know, uh, the, this wonderful legal argument that I had the ability to work on with her. That was special. That was significant. That was that one, you know, moment, that special moment in, in my, uh, you know, career beginning of, of thinking this is what I've worked a good portion of my life to achieve, you know, and, and that was that inspirational moment where, you know, I just, I, I just soaked it in, you know, <laughs> every small detail and, and I loved it, you know, that's one that I'll, I'll, I'll carry with me for the rest of my life. Was that your first time in the courtroom as like a lawyer and going outside no, the gates? No, um, it was my first time in the courtroom on Aboriginal issues. So I had been, you know, um, at provincial court with the UBC First Nations Legal Clinic on, you know, smaller, uh, smaller proceedings. But that was that first. I, you know, honestly, I don't think many articled students get that experience going with your hero to, you know, to court, to argue on behalf of your community. It's almost magical, like, you know, in, in well, from an article student's perspective, but it was, uh, it was like the, the, the clouds had parted and the angels sang, so to speak, but it, it, it was pretty special to me, yeah. What was the first time that you yourself were the person, you know, standing up and arguing for Aboriginal rights and title, do you remember? When was the first time? I was about 22 years old. Um, I had walked into the UBC First Nations Legal Clinic. I have two other family members who went through uh, UBC law and absolutely told me, you must do the legal clinic. It is a wonderful life 
you know, a life-changing experience. And essentially what it is in a 20-second summary is a, a legal clinic that runs out of the downtown east side helping Aboriginal clients with their, their legal issues. So sometimes these clients may not have any other means of accessing legal representation. And so um, walking in, it's, it's from the moment you walk into to the, the legal clinic, it's kind of flying by the seat of your pants. You know, you, you have some training and you're obviously over, you know, you're, you're supervised by a practicing lawyer. But all of a sudden you're running trials and, you know, you're hearing, you're doing these, these, you know, uh, these appearances in 101 and if you ever have the chance to go to the provincial court down at 222 Main Street, it is an absolute, it, people are coming, people are going, it, it's, it's a crazy center, you know, a very busy hub. And so here I am at about 22 years old with a, you know, first year law, you know, training. And then all of a sudden I'm told, okay, so you have um, 11 trials throughout, you know, your time here at the clinic. And I was like, what? Right? So really there's no easy way to gracefully enter into the courtroom, you know, uh, but the first time I remember forgetting, you know, and I was actually told how to introduce myself. There's a script, you know, you need to spell or say your last name, spell it out, initial R, you know, and then say that you're an article student for so and so. And I got to the, the, the bench and the judge is looking at me, waiting for me to, to start my spiel and I'm frozen. And I'm like, I, it was one of those moments that you, only expect that really exists on TV, but I forgot my own name and what I was supposed to say. And luckily I had the foresight to write down what I needed to say. <laughs> so I looked down after like one of those really awkward, like prolonged moments where the judge is looking at me going, okay. <laughs> I'm like, oh, that's right. This is where I say something. I tell them who I am. And, and that is always, you know, that, that, blazing moment of, of my, you know, entry into, into the courtroom. Um, not such a proud moment, but always one that I'll remember. Yeah. <laughs> Are there some things that, even now when you're practicing law, that stand out from your years as an articling student, your years in law school, that are kind of, um, like, good reminders of, like, how to practice law or... Um, like kind of teachable moments that come up for you from way back when? Teachable moments right now. <sighs> you know, I'm not quite sure. To be perfectly honest, I have to sit here and think about it. Teachable moments. You know, I think the one thing that I, I've learned throughout my articling years, throughout, you know, my three years of practice so far, is to expect the unexpected. You know, if something is going to go sideways or has a chance of going sideways, it probably will. You know, and, and that, that really is, is what I've learned. And no matter how much time that you think you can allot to being prepared, there's always something that pops up. You know, um, the legal profession is very challenging, you know, in, in terms of, of how lawyers perform, how we manage our time. and and how much we have to give to our files. We give a lot of ourselves. And I find with knowing that, you know, um, articling really taught me that. It's, it's, you know, but you do it for the nobility of the cause because you believe in it. You know, um, I, I know that a certain percentage of lawyers enter the profession because it is, a, a, you know, um, it's a comfortable profession. It, there's very few stories of, of lawyers being unsuccessful. So for whatever motivators, but you know, there is a, a certain nobility in the legal profession because at the end of the day, you're, you're you know, working towards um, the, the greater goals of protecting democracy and you know, making sure that uh, the legal system, everybody benefits or everybody their rights to a fair trial are, are protected. 
So, you know, there, there is a, a, a certain beauty to the profession itself that, that lends, um, you know, I, I think the inspiration for lawyers to do what they do on, for, you know, decades at a time. I mean, I have no doubt I will be a practicing lawyer for the rest of my life, not because of, you know, the, the financial gain, but because I believe in, in you know, the, the achievement of the system. So, I think I, I think I kind of wandered off on that question a little bit, but anyways, sorry. Teachable moments, I, I, I don't know that I could just say, well, if you do X and Y, you know, you'll, you'll be fine in practice. Practice will throw you, you know, lots of curveballs, but it keeps it interesting, so. Um, what is one of your favorite memories of Louise? My favorite memories, I mean, other than standing next to her, you know, um, as she, she argued the law on behalf of my community, um, I actually remember my favorite time with her was <coughs> sitting in a garden with Louise. Uh, we were in on one of the islands, uh, the San Juan Islands, or you know the ones between here and the island, um, and we were at a Mandel Pinder retreat. And it was the, you know, the day couldn't have been more perfect sitting in a garden talking with, you know, uh, your, your mentor, your teacher, your hero, you know, and, and just talking about the reasons why, you know, we, we choose law, you know, and the, those deeply personal moments of, of you know, um, law can be, you know, exciting, triumphant, frustrating. You know, very tiresome. It can it provide a, a whole gamut of feelings. You know, inspiration, and and sometimes I think as a lawyer, we you know, throughout our our years of practice, we have to dig deep and you know, and find that inspiration. And so, hearing from a lawyer who you know has walked a, a beautiful path in her career, you know, what kept her inspired? What kept her going? You know, those are the things. Um, a young lawyer wants to hear from uh, an experienced lawyer and and to me you know just seeing okay so I'm not so alone in my thoughts or, or my feelings I do struggle for inspiration I think as, as anybody would in, in a challenging profession um, but that always stood out as the the most favorite moment of mine with Louise because it, it was a personal one of, of a human being talking to another human being, you know, um, and yeah, that would have to be it. Um, can you talk a little bit about your starting off as an art thing student and then kind of how your career has developed over the years? Starting off as an art of thing student, uh, well, I was at the union. Um, for seven years and then I jumped right into articling and it was wonderful it was at Mandel Pinder which is you know the one place I always wanted to to go and do my articles and then um, it was a really challenging year that year um, not because of the content of, of the articling experience itself but I had a profound loss that year and um, it was challenging uh, at some points I didn't know that it, you know, it would have gone or whether I would have succeeded. Um, the, my grandparents uh, both died the same day on Aboriginal Day that summer when I was finishing my article. So I was spending a lot of time going back and forth to be with my grandparents because they were both uh, quite ill. And then the unexpected deaths of both of them on the same day kind of threw everything for a loop. So at that time, I was really questioning, you know, um, if I was doing the right thing. You know, I was articling and, and meeting those articling requirements, but my grandparents were ill. And so trying to balance the family along with the professional obligations was a tough one. Um, but I think in the end, when I look back at it now, it, it all happened a certain way because, you know, some strange way, 
those circumstances at the time provided me the strength to complete and you know um, unfortunately they had passed before I was able to uh, take my oath as a lawyer that year um, but I, I did it and it, again the stars align in these really strange ways but I was very close with my grandfather and my grandfather's birthday was September 15th and so I moved, um, you know, made all of the efforts that I could to make sure that I took my lawyer's oath on September 15th, which happened to be the first day of the union's annual general assembly. And so, you know, the, the stars align in, in funny moments is that he couldn't be there, but I became a lawyer on his birthday, you know, um, in, in an... I don't think that could be any more of an appropriate setting than, you know, um, in front of, of the chiefs that provided encouragement um, to the organization that, that taught me, you know, um, so much about indigenous issues and, and the advancement of, of, um, of our rights. So it, it, it kind of, you know, it came to a very unconventional start, but it had a, a beautiful moment. So that, that was really a transition point for me was September 15th, 2010. And then, you know, I did a really unconventional thing. I, I left Vancouver, you know, and I, most people, 99% of first year lawyers tend to go to firms within, you know, the lower mainland, or at least remain. And I decided to kind of, you know, um, throw caution to the wind, I was going home. I was going home, um, I promptly, you know, informed everybody, I said, okay, I, I'm done, I'm a lawyer, I'm going home to work with my community, and they were like, well, who are you going to work with, well, you know, what, I was like, I don't know, I'm going to figure it out <laughs> once I get there, and so I got rid of everything here in Vancouver, packed up my car, and went home. How I was going to establish the, the legal practice, I don't know. Who my clients were going to be, I don't know. I know nothing about practice management, but I'm going to figure out as I go along. And so that's what happened. It's taken me from, you know, from BC to living in Winnipeg for four months and working on a file there. You know, <laughs> and all of a sudden, I'm, you know, a, a year or two later, I'm you know, chairing international university symposiums in the United States to talk about international water treaties. So, uh, conventional, definitely not. Um, but it's been very exciting. Um, it never stays the same. Uh, you know, and I, I've had to uh, learn a lot. There's a huge learning curve to taking uh, a risk of, of going out on your own. You know, and it's certainly not for everybody. It has its its unique set of challenges, but at the same time, I've I've had a, a variety of experiences that I think a lot of my counterparts who are you know uh, third year calls as lawyers don't necessarily have. Um, what's some of the most challenging work in Aboriginal law for you? Some of the most challenging work. I think, uh, you know, I, I think the area itself is challenging because the, you know, passion and nobility of the cause are one thing. I've worked with indigenous organizations, clients, people for a majority of my life, um, but I also have to interact with the federal and provincial governments. I have to interact with, you know, a, a judiciary who may not be as, um, you know, this area of, of dealing with, you know, bureaucrats, governmental counterparts. That's the challenging part of it, is that, you know, on one hand, you're armed with uh, the, the tools of the trade, you know, decisions um, that advance our legal arguments, but you're also trying to have those moments of, of connecting or explaining to the federal government why they have an obligation. And it, it's not necessarily the easiest job in the world to try to, 
change an entire system or change how a majority of Canadian society um, you know view, has an opinion on on Aboriginal issues you know the the more knowledge people have the easier it is but um, sometimes you can work with people from a certain generation that you know it wasn't that long ago that uh, uh, First Nations people couldn't vote or we couldn't leave, you know, the, the reserve. So, you know, expecting Canadian society to catch up and and um, and understand and appreciate, you know, the, the decisions or those legal victories that we have and how you apply, you know, um, meaningful consultation and accommodation that has probably got to be the most challenging aspect of Aboriginal law, it is the, the, the changing of, or, you know, trying to um, assist in a paradigm shift, having people understand from, you know, uh, I guess that's really what it is, is reconciliation. What I am describing is reconciliation of those two. That's the challenging part in, in what I do. You know, I, I love working on the issues that I do, but it's when I'm interfacing with, you know, the larger Canadian society or the federal governments or the provincial governments that want to, you know, um, deny the existence of, of title and rights or, you know, a, a constitutional obligation to consult and, you know, possibly accommodate. That's the, the strong pushback, and it, it's continuously an uphill battle. Yeah, that'd be the hardest, the hardest part of it all. Are there some things that Louise taught you about some of that negotiation? You know, I am a big, big, uh, I'm a, I learn by observation. And so even when Louise didn't consciously tell me, Rosalie, you need to do X, Y, and Z, I learned by watching her for many years. Um, Louise, you know, was not just a, a lawyer that I had the privilege of working with as an article student. I learned from Louise for many years before that, you know, as my time here at the Union. Um, and the most important thing she ever told me, I was having, you know, a, a bit of a anxious moment, we'll call it, and she just she, she looked at me with that smile that she has, and she has a very calming presence. And she told me that, you know, Grand Chief Stuart Phillip had taught her this, and it was very important that I get it right. Just breathe, you know. And sometimes that is the only thing that you can do in a moment where, you know, uh, things seem to be, you know, having that snowball effect of just getting bigger and bigger and bigger is that sometimes all you can do in the moment is, is just breathe, you know, and, and collect yourself and things are, are, are they're going to still continue to move forward, you know, but you just need to stop for that moment, you know, and, and just be in the moment itself. And I cannot tell you how many times I've found myself just recalling that important teaching that she gave me of just breathe, you know, it'll be all right. And, and uh, yeah, that, that's always what I remember the most as, as uh, the greatest lesson she gave me. <laughs> so what is your favorite memory of Louise? My favorite memory, there, there's many memories that I, I remember Louise having a presence, but the one that sticks out the most actually really isn't in any legal setting. We weren't at a firm, we weren't at a meeting. We were sitting in a garden um, at the Mandel Pender retreat, and it was my favorite time with Louise because she she shared with me um, uh, inspirational words. And as a young, you know, I was an articled student on the brink of becoming a lawyer. Um, she shared her inspirations, her experiences, and and to me that meant the most because at that time. You know, you realize that um, you know somebody as as influential and as established as as Louise Mandel. You know, also had those similar experiences as a lawyer, and so for for me, you know, um, 
uh, as a young woman entering the legal profession, the ability to connect with, with somebody who's been so influential in the profession um, in, in so many ways, to connect with them on a human, you know, to human level, it was a beautiful thing. And, and uh, I really needed to hear that. That was probably my favorite time with her, was just talking you know, uh, about uh, uh, her experiences in law, in the profession, and, and having, you know, the experiences that she does um, as, as the lawyer who she is, it's wonderful. I mean, I love to hear, you know, her, her talk about her experiences, her, you know, how she handled certain situations. How do you respond to, you know, when X, Y, and Z happens? Um, the ability to connect with, with somebody on that at that deep of a level really meant a lot to me, and that's my favorite memory of her. Um, can you talk a little bit about the work that you did with UBCIC and then kind of the connections you had with Louise during that time as well? Sure. So um, there, <clears throat> when I worked with UBCIC, I started, I met Louise in the summer of 2000. I worked with her um, during my time here at the union as a senior policy analyst, and that was probably about seven years, you know, times four meetings a year. That's, you know, quite a number of meetings that, that Louise was at and the ability to work with her. And some way, somehow, during the development of the new relationship accord, I found myself probably at the age of 25, 26, sitting in a room a very senior, prominent and influential lawyers, uh, you know, who were working for BC First Nations on the development of the new relationship accord. And I remember just being in absolute awe because I knew who these, these lawyers were. These were the lawyers that, you know, taught our law classes at UBC Law or wrote the textbooks that other professors relied on to talk about Aboriginal law. We're talking, you know, like the, the heavy hitters. And so I'm sitting in this room and I'm, I'm scared beyond my wildest belief. I don't know how I ended up there. But somehow I'm a young policy analyst with, you know, the, the, the lawyers that I look up to. And so we're discussing, you know, the the new relationship accord. And if you'd ever been in a room with lawyers, you know that it's hard to get in a word edgewise. And so I think Louise must have seen that I wanted to share something, you know, or I was had this burning desire to share. And she just leans over. And she's like, "If you have something to say, you need to say it." And Louise has got a very beautiful, you know, calm approach to her. And that's how it was, is that she, she you know, she kind of knew that I wanted to share something. And, and so she, she created the space for me to share. And I was very intimidated being a young woman at the time, you know, surrounded by all these lawyers that, you know, who am I to tell these lawyers, hey, I, be quiet, I have something to share. But Louise did it for me. And, you know, like, it just seemed like such a small thing, but... You know, when I reflect back, that is a, a very, very um, memorable moment that gave me self-confidence to speak, you know. And in this profession, this area, Indigenous law and politics, you have to have the ability to speak out and speak well. So um, as an advocate, like, that's always, you know, one of those moments that I connect back to Louise is if I have something to say share it, you know, and um, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's that. What are some of the other work that you did with UBCIC as a policy analyst? Some of the other work, uh, the work was very broad and, you know, it kind of took me from here to there. Um, when I first started out, I was working um, in child welfare. There were, there were several big, you know, initiatives or processes going on at the time. One was to create regional Aboriginal authorities for child welfare. So there was five regions in the province, you know, uh, we were working with the Ministry of Child and Family Development, um, and we were working with First Nations and Aboriginal stakeholders, so really um, working with a, a variety of partnerships who had diverse interests and, 
and you know um, uh, points of view on how things should be done. Um, it also took us to you know province-wide meetings uh, with the chiefs on talking about where you know child welfare should go, um, an inherent right to the well-being of children and families. Um, it's a hard topic, you know, and so really learning how to, you know, listen to what the chiefs want and the and you know the uh, framing out the the direction that you're given. How do you, you know, um, take that direction and make it into something, you know, uh, achievable or, or accomplishable? Is is you know it, it's. It can be it can be challenging, um, so like it was an exciting time in Indigenous politics when I was with the Union. We saw the birth of the First Nations Leadership Council, and that Leadership Council created you know other uh, councils such as the First Nations Child and Family Wellness Council, the First Nations Health Council, uh, which was the predecessor to the First Nations Health Authority that is being you know created right now. And is assuming, if, you know, the, the jurisdiction for the, you know, service of, of First Nations health uh, services in BC. So, you know, this was a very exciting time. It was leading up to the Olympics, and and things were changing. You know, um, very very dynamic uh, situation. So really, I, you know, I could. Uh, find myself, you know, in a meeting with the, you know, provincial ministries on a Monday. I could find myself in a chief, uh, you know, an all chiefs forum on the Thursday, or or find myself, you know, working um, with our communities. You know, uh, if the if one particular community asked, you know, for uh, for support or you know, um, wanted me to come meet with them, I would, I would be sent to, to go meet with them, you know, to help them in, in whatever issue they, they wanted help with. So it was really an interesting, you know, a broad variety of, of work things that we did here at the Union at that time. Um, what kind of influence are you hoping to have in the field of Aboriginal law? You spoke about this a little bit earlier. <laughs> You know, I, I thought about this question on, on the way down here, and uh, I think the only answer I could come up with is a positive one. <laughs> I think that's all. The end of the day, I never conscious, conscientiously set out and saying I'm going to have this wonderful impact and influence on Aboriginal law, and you know, I'm a wonderful lawyer, and therefore, um, I think we, at the end of the day for me as, as a person who practices Aboriginal law, I, I want to leave, you know, leave the profession, leave the status or the state of Aboriginal law a better one than which I found it. So for me, you know, um, advancing Aboriginal law, I mean, I can only hope to have a, a career, you know, as influential as Louise Mandel. But you know she's an extraordinary person. Um, whatever impact uh, advancement I can have for my clients, you know, I hope is a positive one. I think you know we're all pieces of a puzzle. Um, we all contribute in our own ways. So so for me, I don't think I necessarily set out for that. But at the end of the day, I have to know for myself: Did I do the best job that I could? You know, did I? You know. Um, get what my what the outcome that my, my clients desired and and you know if I haven't done those things then how can I do them better and I think that's just you know your the the questions that you ask upon self-reflection as any professional but you know for me as a lawyer that's what I hope to accomplish you know the influence that I hope I will have um, in any given scenario kind of my last final question is what are some of like, are there difficulties in being an Aboriginal woman within law or within Aboriginal law? Um, the short answer is yes. <laughs> the way that I, I normally characterize it is that being an Indigenous woman, um, period, I'm a member of the most marginalized sect of Canadian society. 
So anything that I do is going to have, you know, its own unique set of challenges. Am I going to let it be a limiting factor? Absolutely not. I think I, I try to take it and turn it into a positive is that because I'm an indigenous woman, and because it's that much harder, it's all that more important for me to achieve. Why? Because there's younger women in my family who are looking up, you know, for a role model, who deserve a role model. You know, um, when I was a younger woman growing up in Vancouver, there weren't that many role models, you know. And for me, I, I try to be the mentor. I try to be that older cousin, that auntie, that, you know, sister that can be relied upon, you know. And, and so for me, yes, it is, it is hard being an Indigenous woman, you know, um, just in general. In the profession, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, pretty, uh, I'm a pretty unique individual <laughs> in stating that, you know, there's not a heck of a lot of us out there. I probably know most of them in BC, you know, but um, Indigenous women are made of a, a certain type of stock. We're, we're pretty tough. You know, um, and, and, you know, there was a photo shoot that took place in April of last year. And it was a wonderful moment to celebrate the beauty and unique, you know, gift that um, 10 Indigenous female lawyers got together. And we actually shot right outside here, the Union, in the alley. And um, to celebrate our diversity and also, you know, those... Um, uh, the, the cultural uniqueness that each of us have. Um, I think it's wonderful the way that Indigenous women in this profession have, have come together and, and formed deep friendships. Um, I can pick up the phone in any given day, in any given hour, and phone one of my female colleagues. <laughs> and they understand and they're very supportive. And so I think, you know, we've been really blessed in in um, our commonalities as being lawyers, but also being indigenous women. That, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not alone in walking this path. And in fact, I have some very wonderful and powerful predecessors, you know, that I, I feel very privileged to call my colleagues. So indigenous, I, I think it's, um, it's a wonderful thing to be an indigenous woman at this point in time practicing law.